Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Kevin Gashanora Buena. It's a pleasure to welcome you all here to our program tonight, Muestras Artistas. It is a delight to see so many people here. This is our first in person Sephardic Studies event since 2019. Before we get started, I want to just express my sincere gratitude to the, Sephar the Sephardic Studies staff and the Schramm Center for Jewish Studies staff, especially Sarah and Brendan, Grace, Lauren, and uh, Jenny, who is our new Sephardic Studies assistant director, without whom none of this would be possible. So thanks to that team. I'm thrilled to see you all here and have the opportunity to come together to explore and celebrate Sephardic arts and to do so in honor of a community leader here in Seattle, Hazan Isaac Azuz, or as he's also known, Isaac Azos. When I think of Hazan Azuz, I think of the following Ladino refrain or proverb. Kenen buena arvol se arima, buena salombra lo cuvija, which means whomever leans against a good tree is covered in good shade. Hazan Isaac Azuz is the sturdy tree in Seattle's Sephardic community, upon whom generations of Sephardim have leaned, from whom generations have learned, and who has inspired community members, scholars, and students to engage with Sephardic history, culture, language, liturgy, music, and more here in Seattle and across the world. So a special appreciation of Hazan Azuz. And a special appreciation for all of those who have made the Hazan Isaac Azuz Fund for Community Engagement in Sephardic Studies possible. Individuals, institutions here in Seattle and beyond, as well as the UW Hillel and the Division of the Arts here at the University of Washington. Thank you to all of you for your support and your uh, endorsement of our endeavors here in Sephardic Studies. In honor of Hazani Zakazuz, today's symposium spotlights artists' production, artistic production by Sephardim, by Sephardic Jews, in a variety of disciplines, in visual arts, poetry, prose, and music. First of all, to demonstrate that such artistic work indeed exists, that it is evocative, that it is inspiring, that is challenging and that it deserves our attention. There have been so few discussions of Sephardic arts in the public sphere, at the university, in part because scholars and the public have not believed that Sephardic arts exist. Yes, you may have heard of Modigliani. Has anybody heard of Modigliani? Okay the painter, or you might know of the Nobel Prize winning author, Elias Canetti. Anybody know Canetti? A few. But who can name for me their favorite Ladino novelist? Other than Jane Mushabak, <laughs> who is with us today. Hmm, yes. Part is surely due to numbers, certainly in the US, where Sephardim are a tiny fraction of the country's Jewish population. But the truth is that it's not just about numbers. It has to do with the worldview through which we see things here in the United States, a Eurocentric worldview that is also refracted in American culture, American Jewish culture, and the field of Jewish studies, which itself has been shaped by what some commentators refer to as Ashka normativity. That's a real word now. If we go back about a century, 
we can see the foundation of that framework in a very famous newspaper, some of which so, some of you might know about it, the Jewish Daily Forward. And it published an expose about Sephardic Jews from the Ottoman Empire in New York City in the 1920s. And it proclaimed the following. And this is real. In the old country, they're referring to the Ottoman Empire, the main destination of those Jews expelled from Spain in 1492. The Sephardic Jews had no cultural life of their own worth speaking of. They had no common body of customs and traditions, no common literature, no knowledge of or curiosity about their past. I'm glad you're laughing. They had been a backward people in a backward country. And how could they hope to progress in this country? That sentiment has largely gone unchallenged in the public discussion about Sephardic Jews and in the academic sphere as well. And that statement itself, I think, alone justifies the need for a Sephardic studies program and why we need today's symposium, at the very least, to prove all the haters wrong. <laughs> Among the several hundred Ladino novels published in the Ottoman Empire, original works and translations, I want to mention one that I think helps us think about the relationships between the various spheres of cultural creativity. It was called Rafael y Miriam, Novela de la Vida de los Judíos del Oriente. Rafael and Miriam, a novel of the life of the Jews of the Orient, of the East. It was by Ben Isaac Sacerdote, probably a pen name, and it was edited by David Habib, and it appeared in Galata in Istanbul, then the capital of the Ottoman Empire in 1910. We're working on a translation of this, and in fact, can anybody guess how many Ladino novels have been translated into English in the United States? Zero. This, nov this novel begins between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, as the silence of the early morning is broken by the call of the Shamash, the synagogue sexton, rousing his community members to call, to come to synagogue to perform selichot, the penitential prayers chanted in Hebrew, in the Ottoman style, in the Oriental style. So in short, the novel, one work of artistic creativity, begins with a scene of another form of cultural expression. The novel tells the tragic story of two lovers, Rafael and Miriam, who run away from home, not because one is Jewish and one is not, or not only because one is wealthy and one is not. The reason they flee is because Rafael wants to become a painter. And Miriam's wealthy family does not approve. Raphael is criticized as a fantasizer, an idealist who will never make a living, who doesn't understand the realities of the world. They flee to Vienna, then to Italy, where Raphael tries to make it as a painter. And I won't tell you how it ends, you'll have to wait. <laughs> but it's a sad tale. The idea is that becoming a visual artist in that moment in time was like the craziest possible thing that one could possibly do as a Jew coming out of the Ottoman world in the beginning of the 20th century. Poetry, in contrast, is deeply embedded in Sephardic culture. The first rhymed Hebrew poetry developed in medieval Spain as Spanish Jews took inspiration from the Arabic poetry of their Muslim neighbors. Song also has deep roots in Sephardic culture, including in the form of prayer. Just think, for those of you who may know, about Lachadodi, a 16th century composition by an Ottoman-born uh, uh, Ottoman leader, Shalomo al kabetz which is now chanted in every synagogue across the world on Friday nights. Contrast that sacred hymn with the iconoclastic songs of Rosa Eskenazi, the most famous singer 
of early 20th century Greek underground urban music known as Rembetika. She sang in Greek, in Turkish, Ladino, Armenian. And then think of the countless popular Ladino songs sung for every and all occasions. Visual arts, however, were a little different as the Ladino novel intimated, as I suggested earlier. That's partly due to the prohibition against graven images set out in the second commandment of the Torah, of the Hebrew Bible, and partly because of similar concerns about human representation in the broader Islamic world. But visual arts and material culture did exist among Ottoman Jews. And you can see some examples here. What is so significant in these exemplars, in these works of art, in these sacred artifacts, not only the artistic and aesthetic elements, but some of the symbols that are included within them, that reveal how embedded Sephardic Jews were in their Ottoman environment. Note, for example, the star and crescent in each and every one of these objects. We have a ketubah, a Jewish marriage contract, with the star and crescent, the symbol, symbols of the Ottoman Empire and symbols of Islam. We have a fasha, a Torah binder, in the center, again, with a variation of crescent and star in green and red in the center. And then we have a scroll for uh, Purim, Megillat Esther, and the holiday of Purim is coming very soon. And notice at the top, what do you see carved there? But a crescent. These are potent visual clues that the way we may think about the world today the ways we may think about Jews and Muslims, those ways were once conceptualized in different terms. And that has implications for what we might be able to imagine in the future. When you think about textiles and embroidery, this was historically the domain of women. And it's precisely due to gender dynamics that these materials may not have historically been considered real art, but of course, they are. And so too is the art of cuisine, the cuisine you have just sampled. Who here has ever tried to fold the repulgo, the fancy edge of the boreca? I'm serious, has anybody done it? Ah, quite a number of you have. It's not so easy. And it requires skill. It is an art in and of itself. This symposium, seeks to start a conversation about Sephardic arts and about arts produced by Sephardic Jews, to imagine possibilities and collaborations for Sephardic Jewish cultural expression, reclamation, and reinvention here in the 21st century across generations, geography, genre, mediums, and disciplines. It is not only about making Sephardic arts and culture seen, it's a visual metaphor, but it is that. It's also about engagement across the senses, to hear, to feel, to experience. There's no better place to undertake this experiment than right here in Seattle, home to one of the largest and most dynamic communities of Ottoman Ladino-speaking origin Sephardic Jews in the country. Our six accomplished artists have been deeply involved in conversation these past few days, also telling many shakas, jokes. This is a funny group. <laughs> Their work in all of those disciplines invoke the trajectories of the Sephardic Jews since 1492 in Spain to the Ottoman Empire, present-day Turkey, Greece, North Macedonia, and Syria, the cities of Istanbul, Izmir, Chanakale, Monastir, Aleppo, Salonika, traversing the divides between geographies, between Europe and Asia, between Ladino and Arabic-speaking Jewish cultural spheres, transplanted, transformed here in the US. You will now have the opportunity to experience brief introductions 
to their work. I hope that you will continue to think about, reflect, and explore their work further online and in conversation, and I hope that new collaborations and opportunities will emerge in the future. At the end of the presentations of the six artists, we'll have the special opportunity to engage in a conversation with the artists moderated by my colleague, Professor Gabriel, Gabriel Solis, Divisional Dean of Arts here at the University of Washington. Our artists are Sarah Araweste, who will be singing an original Ladino song, Chica Morena, Tom Haviv, who will be reading poetry selections from his work, A Flag of No Nation, Ellen Benjoya Stockheim, presenting her visual art series, A Personal Odyssey from Maimonides to Benjoya, Asher Shasho Levy, performing traditional Hebrew songs, including uh, Yari Bono Aulam, uh, Alam, uh, Nagila Hali, uh, Haliyahu i Refasira Siri. Jane Mushabak reading selections from her novel, Is Hundred Years a Tale, and my very own father, Harry Nahr, debuting a watercolor and ink series, Echoes of Sephardic Salonika, some of which taste of all of this you've been able to see in the room on the other side. So, without further, to, further ado, I present you Nuestros Artistas, our artists. Thank you. Good evening. So, I'm Sarah Arawesti, and my family is from Monastir and Salonika. And I've spent the last 20 years of my artistic career studying my Sephardic heritage. I've been doing so through music, as a singer, and as a composer. There aren't so many contemporary composers today in Ladino, so tonight I'm going to share a song with you that I wrote. It was actually one of the first songs I ever wrote in Ladino, and it is somewhat autobiographical, so I want to explain it before I sing it. I struggled as a child growing up in suburban New Jersey to understand my Ottoman roots. And composing this song was truly the way that helped me understand my ancestry. It was a way for me to explore it. For me, family is at the root of all of the art that I create. I do it as a composer looking forward to my children. I have two beautiful young daughters and I write understanding that what I put into song is my legacy to them and also for other future generations. But I'm inspired by the generations that came before me, my ancestors, who I was lucky enough to see in photographic form. We had many pictures that were brought over to the new country but I also received the gift of very rare black and white silent video footage of my family in Monastir and in Salonika in the 1930s. As I perform my song, you will see behind me this footage. My grandparents came to America during the Balkan Wars in 1912, and they were safely living here. And when they returned in the 1930s, it was to celebrate their honeymoon. They went back to visit family and celebrate this simcha. In this video, you will see members of my extended family close up in Monastir and in Salonika contrasted with these very fun, lively, carefree images of my grandmother in other places in Europe. They also visited Italy, so you'll see some Venice, a little Rome. And that is to lighten up part of this footage because we know here, sitting in this room, that when my grandparents returned to America, 
the family that was left behind that you will see in this video would all perish just a few years later. So this song is called Chica Morena, which I wrote as I watched this video. I'm going to translate it for you so you understand what I'm singing. I am the dark beauty, the one with the long hair and the strong eyes, but with a happy heart. It feels I've lived more than a thousand years. I've crossed seas and borders. One day I will return where the warmth of my mother's land awaits me. I am the dark beauty who was abided by many kings, climbed ladders of gold, married into the world and lived. I've kissed the feet of my children and the hands of my brothers. I'm following the voices of my ancestors to return to the garden of my mother, Chica Morena. De corazón contente Tengo más de mil años He traversado mares y fronteras Un día tornaré a mi tierra Que el calor de mi madre me espera Rena me ama, blanca yo nací, de pasear galana mi color perdí. Chica Marrena, a los reyes he seguido, subido escaleras de oro, casado con el mundo y vivido, pisado los pies de mis hijos y las manos de mis hermanos, siguiendo la voz a mis padres a topar la huerta de mi madre Rena me ama blanca yo nací de pasear galán a mi color perdí Rena me ama blanca yo nací de pasear galán a mi color perdí
Hello, hello. I am Tom Haviv. Thank you so much for having me. This is so beautiful. And Sarah, that was stunning and moving. And the imagery is haunting and beautiful. Um, I am going to read um, and share <clears throat> a brief introduction to my, my book, A Flag of No Nation. Um, we were allotted seven minutes, which feels impossible for a book that is addressing 400 years of history and imagining uh, what the next few centuries might look like. Um, not said humbly at all, but uh, <laughs> um, Devin, you started the conversation, so. Um, okay. <clears throat> the book is dedicated to my grandmother, Yvette Khaviv, born Kariyo. She was born in Istanbul. Um, much of the book is an oral history conducted uh, over five years uh, and recorded in, in video and audio. And I'll read a little bit about that process and the book in, this, in the introduction. <clears throat> Where are you from? The waitress asked my grandmother after hearing the lilt of her accent. Cordoba, my grandmother replied in a breath, as if speaking on a stage to thousands. My grandmother Yvette was born in 1928 in Istanbul to a Sephardi Jewish family. Her relatives were from Izmir, Salonika, Adana, Athens, and Mersin. In 1949, she and my grandfather moved to Israel where they would live together for 60 years. That day, however, in a cafe in rural Ohio, she said Cordoba, the city of her ancestors, Jews who had fled the Inquisition in the 15th century. Cordoba, an unbreakable story. A flag of no nation is my offering to a history that is only beginning to be written, the story of Turkish Jews in the 20th century. It is fundamentally a work of myth-making of family folklore, of allegory, of visions of a world to come. The book is designed to be an instrument of dreaming and action, a talisman that helps its readers pass through barriers of time, language, and distance, through the walls of the political present, and further beyond the walls of political imagination. Throughout the book, the reader will find Yvette's stories and poetry guiding us through her life across oceans of time and memory. Over five years, I recorded our conversations in audio and video and archived all of our emails. I present here her voice, word by word, changing only a few details for readability. The primary intervention is the line break, the shifting shore of text and absence, the trace of my listening, of my appreciation of her words and her voice. The book begins in allegory, a section called Island. This is one of the islands in the Bosphorus. I think it's Bukida, where my family summered. It turns to oral history, a section called Lostlessness that I'll read from briefly, and then to lyric and documentary poetry, and then to performance texts, and then to political visions uh, around the Khamsa flag, which is a flag I designed with some inspiration from the imagery that Devin shared of Sephardi um, visual culture, and uh, specifically a Sephardi ketubah that I, I saw on a Zoom chat <laughs> with Devin several years ago, and um, we'll get to that flag later. We're going back to the beginning of my the oral history, which starts in her childhood memory of Istanbul. And the first story, which I will not read, um, is her memory of her first boyfriend uh, when she was eight, who was a Muslim boy down the block. Um, and her grandmother, or her mother, gave him a cookie. So he must have thought he was 
doing well. Um, should we? <laughs> okay, I, I'm, I'm going to read instead. Then we're in the 30s. This, is, this part is called Mois. Each title is a different person or a proper noun, a place of that time. A voice recording of Yvette, 2015. In those confused times, the 30s, the only person in the family preoccupied with by actualities was my grandfather, Moise Benazilio, 1936. When Mussolini occupied Ethiopia, he was so upset. He predicted the worst for Europe. These events and the fate of the Jews marked my life as a young girl in Istanbul, and also the unrest in Istanbul. Some families fled to the south for fear of a German invasion. When the Nazis took Greece, 1941, my two uncles, the elder brothers of my mother, Joseph and David, were there and they went in hiding in the villages. They were hidden by the Athenian villagers. But David's wife, Gilda, was able to leave because she was a Turkish citizen. And the Turkish consulates everywhere allowed the Jews who had Turkish nationality to go to Turkey. So my aunt and my cousin, I don't know if you met them, they came to Istanbul. One of my uncles, David, who had been born in Saloniki, escaped, illegally arrived in Palestine. What the British did to Palestine, I will never forgive them. Blacked out windows. Voice recording of Yvette, 2015. The Germans had already taken Greece and Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and they were on the border of Turkey. But the Turkish government declared neutrality. The Romanians were conquered because Hitler didn't respect any accord, so we were expecting this war. Why did they black out the windows? We blacked out windows. It was a way of defending from air attacks. And as the Nazis were already at the border, we were given orders to be careful and also to make a reserve of bread, since there was no bread anymore. They began rationing the food in case there is an invasion. But then the Germans stopped and went to the Russian front, and there was no invasion. I'm going to read one more from the section on the oral history section called Mare Emmanuel, which is a story I heard many times growing up. My grandmother didn't, my grandmother went to a Catholic school, which was a, a more uh, well-to-do thing to do. And my grandfather went to an Allianz school, which was the Jewish schools that the, uh, across the Middle East. Uh, and in this Catholic school, there were Jews, Muslims, and Catholics. So this is a story my grandmother told. It's recorded countless times. Here's one instantiation. Mare Emmanuel, Shema. Voice recording of Yvette, 2015. In 1943, our school teacher in Notre Dame de Sion in Istanbul was Mare Emmanuel, a nun and an extraordinary woman of, Bel of Belgian origin. She taught all the students, Catholic, Muslim, Jewish, le saint général, but she gave us Jewish students ethics each week. We took it by choice. It was not an obligation to take the course. One day she said to us, your brothers and sisters in Europe are going through a very bad situation. You must pray for them every night. She said, it is important to pray even if you are not used to praying. So she wrote on the blackboard in Latin characters the words of the prayer she wanted us to make. And it went, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu. It turns out she had spoken to a rabbi to choose a prayer. Yet as soon as she wrote it, it was erased. Why? At the time, it was, a, it was forbidden by the new government to have any lessons of religion. The director of the school from the Ministry of Education was watching, always watching. But we prayed it, together then. It was my first prayer. I prayed it each evening until the end of the war. That's a photo of my grandmother and grandfather going to Israel in 49 in the Mediterranean. I have no, I'm going to jump out of the oral history and I'll read a brief poem. 
we, they, I. This is a section called um, An Arrow, A Wing, and it documents much that took place in the Holocaust in Salonika that was already mentioned tonight. Um, and it also chronicles my grandfather's early onset blindness um, as he was in the foreign service in Israel. So he, he passes away in the page before. We, they, I. We read the news, a sundered fruit. It is a hand tearing at leaves. They are everywhere. They are surrounding us. We, I, remember the words, Hebrew forms, sheket, maspik, die. They remember, they forget, they sleep. We awaken, we lose time, we are lost. We rush, we regret, we fear. I, we, remember him, his words echoing. Do they no longer love each other? She refers to herself by her maiden name, Kadio. Pear, apple, Habib, Kadio, a broken Mediterranean. I, they, we. I left my Jewishness for shame of a broken story. I returned to these details to understand what was lost. How we lost our pathway back through the hills, past an old border, new borders of mind preventing return. They are us, we are I, I am they, they is I, I is we, we is they. Happiness is an open palm, the sun pulsing at center. He gripped his chair in the balcony in Ramat Aviv. He listened to the melody of Ellington. He followed it out of the poem and out of his life. He was blind and he, he would help, hold, have to hold people's shoulder or hand to walk anywhere for much of his life. So that's where this comes from. I grip your shoulder. You grip my shoulder. We are blind. The white light fractures mind. To tell a story, you must break a story. The news is a hand tearing at leaves. To break a story, must you believe in a story too much or not at all? Is it to know some memory follows us so far, we wonder will it follow our children and their children? Or will it stop on the imagined border of this white page? Or will it turn back toward the unmade road across uncrossed borders, mountains unmet, toward the temporary heat that follows us over centuries. Should I? Yeah. Um, and a flag, uh, it's a flag for peace and solidarity between Jews and Muslims, um, and inspired by Ottoman Jewry and, and expanded um, yeah, intersectional vision of what the Middle East, could, Middle East could look like, and uh, the shared symbol. I can talk more about it. Well, after spending um, the better part of almost three days together with this group of artists, when I s hear them perform, I realize how great their contributions are and how impressed I am when I actually see them perform. So I'm really grateful to be part of this group. <clears throat> this is a personal odyssey from Maimonides to Ben Joya. I thought it would start with the Inquisition in 1492 and end in 1968 when Pope Paul VI closed the office of the Inquisition. But that wasn't the way it went. My odyssey began wandering around the streets of Toledo, entering El Transito with its golden friezes, stumbling upon a sculpture of Maimonides in Cordova, Wondering, was this the artist's brother wearing a turban and dress-up clothes? I read the guide to the perplexed and remained perplexed. <laughs> My odyssey, oops, <laughs> sorry. My odyssey took a turn to Egypt, into the crypt of Ben Ezra. The fragments traveled and landed in Cambridge, 
While in New York City reading a letter that Maimonides had written in his own hand, I started to feel very close to him. The places began, to, the pieces began to fall together as I painted. Dancing greats, Roger, Romanticism, Izmir, Istanbul, religion and fantasy. Family memories and documents end. The French painter Camille Roger in 1847, he painted a picture of the Orient in the 19th century, scenes of domesticity, ermine in the wrong places, dance of the fiance, a fantasy wedding in Smyrna, a Torah ark, and a map of the holy places. I really needed a map out of my fantasy world. I created this artist book titled Izmir. This is the cover. It's a non-traditional form of a book. It pre preserves the Nahum Benjoya family through a personal lens, a 500-year history of Sephardic Jews, the degree of expulsion, Isabel, Ferdinand, 1492. But Izmir, the artist's book, focuses on Sephardic Jews who fled to the safety of the Ottoman Empire. After leaving Spain, they lived in Sephardic communities in the Ottoman. They maintained Judeo-Spanish and Solitreo script until the present. The cover of the book is a watermark that is inspired by Solitreo script. Open the book. Every Odyssey needs a map. The interior of the portfolio is a map dated 1893 of Turkey and Asia with an inset of Smyrna now known as Izmir. But I do have to tell you a little bit of the story of this map because I was in Cambridge, England. I went into this old junky bookstore and I'm looking around and there is this map. Well, I have to say that I'd already made this book, the artist book Izmir. I had formed all the pages, I had printed all the art, I had recorded all the text. My brother put it in, you know, he helped me put the text into words from the, from the recordings. Anyway, I got home and the map fit exactly in the book. Now, I don't, I, I'll let you explain how that happened. <laughs> My family remained in Izmir for 400 years and at the beginning of World War I, they emigrated to Cuba, South America, and the United States. Some remained in Montevideo and Buenos Aires. The pages of this book are not bound. I formed each individual sheet of Gompi paper to, as to assemble the book. This image of my grandparents, Dora and Isaac Benjoya. They emigrated to Cuba, but things didn't work out so well for them there. And they returned to the community of Sephardic Jews from Turkey living in Coney Island. Isaac Benjoya, a natural linguist, spoke six languages. He was a chef, a movie man, he owned a candy stand in Coney Island subway station. He helped found the Torah Israel Synagogue on 13th Street in Brighton Beach 
and the Sephardic home for the aged in Bay Ridge. Dora sang the songs from mother to daughter, from generation to generation, romances, lullabies of queens and princesses, of life and love, of longing and pain. She cooked the delicious food, the fasulia, the fideos, the borecas, the fritadas, the travados de fila. She sewed exquisite textiles. She had manos de oro, hands of gold. But even as women kept the culture from fraying, their contributions were often undervalued. Word as image, thin paper and text showing through appears in many of my pieces. This letter in solitario script was found in the bureau of my grandfather after he died. In 2000, Professor Isaac Jerusalami, born in Istanbul, educated in Paris, taught at Hebrew Union College and translated the letter for me. He asked if he could keep a copy, he said. We usually get grocery lists, but this is a very juicy letter. I'm not gonna read you the six-page letter. I know you want me to, <laughs> but it is about Bohoda, firstborn, Kalamira Benjoya, Isaac's mother. Her husband, Mordechai, had died in his mirror, and she was alone. The letter describes the fate of Bohoda Kalamira Benjoya when she arrived in the United States. Dora lost four children before Rochelle, my mother, survived and had three daughters born later, Luna, Kalamira, and Estrella. Rachel attended Abraham Lincoln High School in Brooklyn and graduated from Brooklyn College in 1944. She went to graduate school at the University of Pittsburgh, a remarkable accomplishment for a child growing up in poverty with traditional roles for men and women. Rachel collected the photographs and the documents that are included in the book, in the artist book, is Mir. Her lifelong study of Sephardic language and culture is the inspiration for the book. She recorded memories at the University of Arizona College of Music. My Odyssey contains memories, poor immigrants, photos fading, documents crumbling, and textiles unraveling. Izmir the book is important to my family, and I hope important for the future of Sephardic culture. Gompi paper was used for ancient text. Individual sheets of Gompi paper were formed for the original art and the text of the book. All the materials in the book are made of archival material that can survive for the next 500 years, if, and there are many ifs in the future. In the book, there are 40 prints and 22 pages of my mother Rachel Benjoya's memory. Please read the entire book online and view all the art on the website. And if you have a time to look at the vitrine, in the room we were in, please take a look at that. And don't forget to go to the website and read the juicy translation of the letter that started my odyssey. Thank you. So good to be here. So good to be here these past few days among this just incredible cohort of Sephardic artists. My name is Asher Shasho Levy, and I'm going to be performing some traditional piyutim from the, uh, the repertoire of my family. We're Sephardic Jews who came from Aleppo, from Antab, which is now uh, Ghazi Antab in Turkey, uh, Kilis, and Alexandria. <laughs> I'm 
Señor del mundo y siempre y siempre tú el rey el rey de los reyes y
there's, there's, there's so much that I could say about this music, but my time is limited, so I'd rather play one more song. So you can ask me questions later, but uh, suffice to say, these are all songs that I learned uh, from my family growing up that are part of the, uh, the Syrian and general Ottoman Jewish repertoire of songs. Um, the first song, Yari Bon Alam, uh, second one, Nagila Hallelujah. Some of them are more modern compositions musically, some of them are older. This last one, Refasiri El Ne'eman, is a beautiful, a beautiful piyut of healing that was written by the uh, Aleppo rabbi, Rafael Antevi Tabush, and he took the melody from a, uh, from a Ladino song. Thank you so much. And again, what a, what a joy to be a part of this truly historic and remarkable event, gathering so many incredibly talented uh, Sephardic artists. Uh, what a joy, what an honor. I'm Jane Moshebach, and hi everybody. I love this group of artists, and I love this terrific audience. 
I'm going to read a chapter from my novel. The name of the novel is His Hundred Years, A Tale. He, the main character, is a Turkish Jew, and he has an unusual passion. He loves selling. This is not unusual in the Middle East, in Turkey, but that is his passion. He's a peddler in the Ottoman Empire and later in New York. He's never given a name in this book, nor is anyone else in the story, but his hundred years are the 1900s, the 20th century. He's a 20th century boy, a 20th century man, and I give you the chapter called, if I can read, let's see, I think I've got it. I gotta get the light right here. Hello, okay, I don't know if I can do this. Let's see, boardwalk along the Atlantic Ocean 1958, he was running, and he had several songs running, whoops, I think, I don't know if I can do this, because the light is weird, okay, he was running, and he had several songs running in his head, he breathed in the air with its salt edges and seaweed smell, he felt the newly risen sun on the shore, the ocean. Oh, thank you. Oh, look at you. I love this. I told you I love this place. Thank you. Okay. So this is Boardwalk Along the Atlantic Ocean, 1958. He was alone at 6 a.m. with the gulls screaming as they veered in wild arcs and dips by the jetty and up the sand. The ocean rolled in and out with the slow shushing sound of steady breathing, sliding up the sand and pulling back in a series of thoughtful and thoughtless offerings and retractions. As he ran, the narrow planks of the boardwalk quietly jostled in that hunky-tonk of old boardwalks exalted and hallowed be God's great name in this world of his creation, amen. He could run because he could breathe because his mother was no longer in agony and he was no longer in an agony of guilt that he had not found a way to lessen her agony. She screamed in frustration and anger when he last saw her in the hospital. This was not the mother he'd known, his business partner in childhood adventures of survival when the food was gone in the war. You eat, she used to say, I've already eaten. Honky tonk. May his will be fulfilled in the revelation of his sovereignty and the flowering of his salvation. Amen. How many times would the circle go around in his head? He was the provider, the businessman, the manager, the salesman. Would she have wanted him to drop everything, to take her into his house, to demand his wife take her in, when his sister said it was time for her to go to the home, but the home would not take her, and instead she went to the hospital? No, she wouldn't have wanted him to come to a dead halt and go back to a standstill of no money, she wouldn't have allowed that. He had his children, his business. She would have said, no, don't do it. You are my business partner, keep going forward. Don't get pulled back for me. He knew his mother. His mother has, had always counted on his going forward. Keep going, she'd say. She'd laugh. He watched his sneakers on the boardwalk, his feet po pointed forward without confusion, his body 
was tall, his arms keeping his body company. But was that it? That she should have been there for him to send him and his into the world to go further and further, to break free of the pullback into nothingness. That she should have propelled him. And oh, that laugh. She used to laugh he'd say, and his father would look in the doorway with that quizzical look on his face. What was she laughing at? Who was she laughing at? She, tried, she used to laugh, and that laugh had always made the man running now along the boardwalk at 6 a.m. happy because it meant she was proud of him for moving ahead, for being a child man and then a grown man for breaking away from whatever was holding them down in the old country for centuries. Because there was nothing that a man could do there to make money, and it was the end. But was that it? That she should have been there to propel him, but he didn't need to be there for her? May he hasten the coming of his anointed Messiah in your lifetime and in the life of the whole house of Israel speedily and soon, and say ye, Amen. He got to the metal bar at the end of the boardwalk and touched it and turned. Although the breezes from the ocean washed both the anxiety and relief from him, he was sweating in the early morning sun. At home, he'd shower and dress for business and make himself rye toast and olive oil, a cup of yogurt, and a cut-up peach. Then the best tide of all. At seven, he'd walk crisply out the door to join the men, be recognized, greeted, welcomed at the synagogue a block from his house. It was what he needed a group of men who looked like him, who made a living, the providers in the houses all around them, in the white shirts, the ties, the humor, the understanding of the perils and dares of a man's life. He was there every morning at 7. They knew his name. He got to know theirs. Each one was a story of work and women and children and a Jewish father and a Jewish mother, honky-tonk, be his great name blessed forever, yes, throughout eternity. His breathing sounded his exertion. He was in his prime and strong, but he was sweating. How did others do it, he wondered, without running every morning? How did they lose their most wonderful mothers without saying Kaddish every day? How did they joke with their wives at dinner without having had that early morning brotherhood? She always laughed, he said, feeling his sweat rolling down from his scalp, saving him from having to decide between grief and relief, fear and pleasure. Keep going is what she wanted. Kaddish was nearly a thousand years old. His father had said Kaddish for his mother and his father. Kaddish felt as old as the gulls spinning in wild arcs around the glory of the sun-spangled ocean. But running was new. He would find that book and buy copies for everyone he knew, the first guide to jogging. And for the rest of his life, every morning, he would jog on the boardwalk, on the city streets, on his living room floor, in his socks when he was 98. The men in the Minyan were there for him every day, 
just to be there with him and each other to pray. Not to sell insurance, not to manage an office or agents, not to inspire, not to provide. And yet, in the small room in the shul basement with its plain walls and plain chairs, as he got to know them, well, of course, one day they would say as they were heading out the door, I understand you sell insurance. His mother used to laugh when they were starving and when she was cooking great feasts. The name of the Most Holy One be blessed, praised and honored, extolled and glorified, adored and supremely exalted beyond the power of all blessings, hymns, praises, and consolations of this world to express and say ye, Amen. Thank you. My name is Harry Narr, and um, I want to thank you all for being here today. This has been for me, and I hope for all of you, a wonderful, wonderful experience. Modigliani. Mark Chagall, Mark Rothko, Louise Nevelson, Adolf Gottlieb. These are all famous artists who are Jewish. But is there Jewish art? Back in 1960, art critic Harold Rosenberg reflected on this question. He suggested that there is a Gentile answer to this question and a Jewish one. Some non-Jews would say, there is a Jewish art, while others will say there is no Jewish art. But the Jewish answer is, what do you mean by Jewish art? I'm a Sephardic Jew. I grew up in a Sephardic home, and I am also first-generation American. My father was born in Salonika, Greece. His parents, five sisters, three brothers, immigrated to the United States in 1924. Another brother, the oldest, remained in Salonika, and he and his family ultimately and sadly perished in Auschwitz. Most of the family, and, and over here is a picture of my grandparents, and the large image of them is typical garb that they wore and then to the right is more contemporary clothing. And down at the bottom here is Congregation Etzachayim, where my grandfather became the first uh, rabbi. Most, most of the family, fortunately, came to the US because my nono, my grandfather, Chaim Benjamin Nar, was invited to become the first ordained rabbi a congregation at Zachayim in New Brunswick, New Jersey. He also practiced Kabbalah. And here is an actual uh, image from one of his journals. <clears throat> As a small child, I remember being captivated by his diagrams and pictographs. In retrospect, the mysterious Kabbalistic symbols and the fine markings may have played in a subconscious way an important role in the development of my own art. It is through the building of marks, whether with ink or with paint, that I created images. And here is a, a large drawing that I did made with a felt tip pen. And this is from this area here of Ravenna Park. <clears throat> so I'm a representational artist. For over 50 years, I've created visual images, mainly still lifes, landscapes, and figures. These images come from direct observation, memory, 
imagination. And this is one of my uh, still life paintings. And this is a portrait of my father who posed for me many years ago. He was always involved in looking at the stocks. <laughs> and then, then over here on the left is a landscape of rocks. And the reason I put this together is because I think it relates very closely to the destruction of the Jewish cemetery in Salonika. And here we have uh, the Greeks taking away the tombstones, destroying them. And if you go to Salonika, you can see many of the tombstones still being used as rock walkways or linings of interiors of swimming pools and things like that. <clears throat> The series of 10 paintings entitled Echoes of Sephardic Salonika began in 2019 and was inspired by my extensive conversations with my son, Professor Devin Nahr, about our family stories, memories, and my readings about Salonika and my visits there in commemoration of the 76th anniversary of the deportation to Auschwitz. Over here, this drawing, this is usually how I work. I do a lot of sketches. And for this image here called Black Sabbath, there were many other sketches. And Black Sabbath was a horrible time in, in Salonika, where the Nazis came in and selected all the Jewish men and put them into an area where they were forced to do exercises in the hot sun. And some of them didn't survive, and you can see here a German soldier, soldier beating on him. So in the end, am I a Sephardic Jewish artist? I would say that I am an artist who is Sephardic Jew, and I created images depicting Sephardic Jewish life and death in my Salonika series, but my style is my own, reflected in this series and my work that represents the world beyond. Thank you. I'd like to invite all of the artists up and we're going to have a panel conversation led by my colleague, Professor Gabriel Solis. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, as we're getting seated, uh, just maybe one more time, uh, join me in just a huge recognition of how remarkable that really was. It's, um, it's, it's a treat uh, and <laughs> and an honor to have the chance to be in at least some conversation here, um, knowing that it's also been a bit of a long evening, uh, and, and probably there's very few words that can really, um, in the end, do more than what we just saw and heard. And so again, I say thank you. Um, we were in conversation yesterday a bit, and it, it's a remarkable sort of thing to hear these artists think about their work out loud together and think about their lives as artists out loud together. So I thought maybe a few questions that um, came out of that conversation would help just contextualize uh, some of what you, you heard. Um, for me, as a, as a, um, a musician and a music scholar uh, and as someone who leads the whole arts programs, all of the arts programs here, uh, at the university, it's really vital seeing um, these different arts uh, in connection with each other for me. Um, and thinking about, uh, you know, the, the question, Harry, you brought up there at the end, like is there Jewish art, is there Sephardic art? Uh, we'd probably be here all night. And so maybe we won't ask that question. Um, but, but I thought I'd, I'd lob a couple of questions at, 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 at you um, and see where they go. Um, and the first one is that um, uh, Devin started with this idea that, 
you know, Sephardim, is, so we're a small group of people uh, in the world, and it, it, it could then seem like making Sephardic art or making art as, uh, making Sephardic art, uh, is kind of niche. Um, that's a word that came up in our conversation, uh, but it seems like it's also a thing that expresses universal experiences and much broader things. Um, so I wanted to ask maybe Sarah and Asher if you, you wanted to speak a little bit about the way that you're, you see your work as expressing uh, to an audience either in a, in a way that's a kind of niche uh, and directed or, or broad, more broad and more universal in its, its themes and capacities. It's an interesting question. Um, a lot of the work that I do, I mean, tonight what I was presenting is very traditional music. It's music that I learned in the context of the home uh, from my grandparents, from my father in the synagogue. Um, and so when I'm, <coughs> excuse me, so when I'm presenting that sort of music in that context, I feel that it's, in some sense, it's less of uh, my art as like a creative expression and more as a, a sort of a carrier for a conversation about my, uh, my tradition and in, in sort of an entryway, a portal into this world. So the, the niche aspect of it is actually, uh, uh, I think it, it, it's something that makes it compelling. And so when I've played performances of, of Pew Team and Sephardic music, liturgical music, like very specific internal repertoires that you'd only be hearing normally in the community and bring it uh, out to you know a secular venue or something that has nothing really to do with anything Sephardic, it can really be, uh, a point of contact. <laughs> For me, I think you know, the language might be niche, but the themes that underlie so much of Sephardic repertoire is so universal, and that's that's why I love the traditional music so much. And in my own work, I try to make it as universal and accessible as possible. I mean, the song that I performed tonight was about searching for home and connecting with roots. Um, you, you can't get much more universal than that. Everybody can, can relate to that. And even one of my, my most proud projects was a, a children's album in 2016. And while the language was in Ladino, they were just regular songs about waking up in the morning and brushing your teeth and animals on a farm and you know the same topics that people write songs in any language. It just happens to be that my vehicle is through Ladino. So I don't think it's so, so niche. I mean, good music is good music. <laughs> That's what I think. It doesn't matter what language it, it's in. If you can emote, if you can feel from it, if you can if you, you have a visceral reaction and you can tap your hands and clap your, you know, clap your fingers, that's music. It doesn't matter the language. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so another thing that, that I think is really a, a theme here, or something that really comes up repeatedly in this work um, and was very much a part of our conversation yesterday, is the idea of art as a kind of archive. Um, it's something that, that holds the past within it and, and yet also something that points to the future. Um, and I, I think that's, that's really like strikingly true in the work, uh, much of the work, maybe all of the work we saw today. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I was curious, uh, maybe Ellen and Tom, if you had an interest in reflecting, since I think your work in particular is sort of pointed at the question of you know, the, the, this notion of the past 500 years and, and maybe the next 500 years, um, what it means to do work that is, is both um, archival in a sense uh, and also, you know, fu futurist or future oriented in another way. Okay, <laughs> but anyway, what I can say about that is that I started this project as all my projects go. I said, this is gonna be easy. You just talk to your mother for a few hours and you'll figure it out. 
Yeah, well, 10 years later, I still haven't figured it out, but it was, it was a remarkable experience to learn how much my mother knew and how little I knew. And, you know, that was like a change in my life because I always thought I knew more than her. So, you know, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> what can I say? It was a great experience and it got more and more complicated the more I made it my own art. And um, it wasn't just the printmaking and the storytelling and the paper making and the, <clears throat> the maps and everything. It just, it kind of, this odyssey got out of hand. And I knew it was out of hand when I started reading the guide for the perplexed. I thought, uh-oh, this is really, I'm losing it. <laughs> but anyway, I, I'm going to uh, does this does this work? Yeah. Um, I'm still also stuck on the, the universal question, the sure. first question, and I'm just thinking about, um, yeah, my relationship to Sephardic history and culture, like, since I was a kid, was a relationship to secrets. Um, I, I grew up around, you know, hearing Turkish, hearing French, hearing Hebrew, hearing snippets of Ladino, and it was all impenetrable to me. Um, and that was interesting. And it became so simple when I looked at my last name, and I actually had an interesting conversation last night with someone who was like, oh, Chaviv, Chavib. That was the name of one of the Sephardic rabbis of, uh, chief rabbis of the Ottoman Empire, Shlomo Chaviv. I said, I said to this person, that's my father's name. Um, and over many years, anecdotally, I would have the same conversation with friends of mine who are Muslim. Oh, Habib, that's my cousin's name. So Habib, in the, it's cooked into, there's a secret kind of like, a, and also speaking of Kabbalah, is also a secret tradition that is deeply Sephardic in its origin, and it's at the basis of Judaism. So that's all interesting, and I think to the, to the, future, the future orientedness of looking at the past, I'm thinking about the expression of a Sephardic poet and scholar, Amiel Alkali, uh, whom I recommend to you all who are interested in this, in the literature of Se Sephardic Jews and Levantine people, um, memories of our future, and basically thinking about what has happened as not having stopped happening. <laughs> you know, that what has happened in the past is layered in the present and has is, and is layered in many different ways. Some of it is layered in terms of just the texture of what we see, and some of it is repressed and made invisible. We've talked a lot about what is invisible in Sephardic culture and larger Jewish culture and in, in, in the Muslim world, which is a complex story that is, yeah, that is beautiful and also tragic. So I think I've, I've thought about the expression Judeo-futurism, Sephardi and Mizrahi futurism in relationship to other futurist traditions uh, in American, in, 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 in art history. And my question for the, the people who are asking the question, what is a Sephardic artist or what is an artist who explores Sephardic culture? Um, yeah, what does ancestral tradition have to do with envisioning futures is primary for, for me. It's a little circular, but yeah. it is circular. It's <laughs> nonlinear. But that's, that's the thing, right, about yeah. the past and the future and the yeah. present is they're all, I don't know, a flat circle or something. Um, that's, yeah, no, that's great, thank you. Appreciate it. And um, actually your, your point about your experience of Sephardic life as being about this multilingual space, um, it's interesting, we spend a lot of time, I think, talking about Ladino specifically, or, or you know, Judeo-Spanish. Um, but I was interested in our conversations, uh, uh, Jane, you were talking about the ways that your sense of uh, working as both a writer and a teacher, um, you also shared that sense that, that the, the multilingualism of America is also part of your experience of like the multilingualism of being Sephardic and that, that this was really generative for you. And I was, I was just curious um, to hear, hear a little more about that and I thought people might be interested in the ways that you think of language mm -hmm. uh, and, and multiplicity, I guess, multiplicity, as yeah. a Sephardic experience. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, multiplicity. Oh, thank you. 
thing. Is it on? Hello? Yes. Uh, yeah, sometimes I wonder uh, if it's possible for Sephardim to get anything done <laughs> because there's so much multiplicity uh, that we are interested in everything and every language and every opportunity and there, there is that love of multiplicity that is built in from the Sephardic diaspora and from, I don't know, something genetic or something intellectual that is so open to the world that it, it can be hard to slow down and write um, a novel. <laughs> so uh, what um, Gabriel is referring to is I uh, taught for many years at City University in New York and uh, the population, the student population, was largely uh, students of color, but uh, from all over the world. And I sometimes would do a survey of uh, what languages were spoken in the home of each student. And in a class of 20 students, we discovered 18 languages that these students had grown up with and were still going home in Queens and the Bronx and Brooklyn to their families where they spoke those languages. So that is a kind of a pleasure that represents a kind of richness that we see in the human race. And maybe in the traditional Jewish phrase, the 70 nations of the world is part of the exhilaration of consciousness that you're not just in your own skin and in your own history, but you are aware of this. It's very exhilarating to have that awareness, and that's that's part of uh, that's that's part of the thrill of being open to these foundational aspects of Judaism. That we care about the seventy nations. That's what the number was at the time. I don't know what the, the number is today, how many nations of the world, but that's how it's stated. Where? In the Torah? In the, I don't know, I think in the, in, in the Bible. Uh, so the 70 nations of the world. So, uh, but meanwhile, with all those nations, the family unit is that thing that you live with that is packed with blessings and pleasure, but also with conflict and worry and anxiety. So that's how I focus my mind about, as in that character, uh, trying to run away from his grief and continually coming back to the Kaddish to, to meet his needs, to feel all of his feelings about losing his wonderful mother. That's lovely, thank you. And um, certainly I think this idea of, of the, the delight in knowing others' stories and, and really um, focusing not only on ourselves but on, on the, the, the richness of, of the rest of the world is, is, is a part of the true experience we get from art, right? That this evening, uh, you've all shared. I mean, there's a, something really lovely about that. So thank you. And um, uh, Harry, I'm, I'm tempted to ask you to come back to the question of whether there is Sephardic art, but um, <laughs> since you asked it. Uh, but I, actually, I wanted to ask it slightly different way. Um, uh, knowing that you're, you're an artist, you're also an art historian, uh, you're also, right, you're a teacher, um, you've been involved in, in thinking about and curating this kind of thing for a while. And um, I'm interested, given the u somewhat uniqueness of this particular collection of folks uh, and the time you've all had together, how, how this project has uh, helped you reflect on your own art um, and, and whether it's changed your view of what you do and you know, what you want to do. Um, that's a, a difficult question to answer. <laughs> but, um, you know, being among the other artists here, 
and working on this series. Um, in, in many ways, the series starts with um, a kind of reflection on the Salonika of the past and then the horrors and tribulations that my family went through and the people of Salonika went through and how Salonika is no longer like it used to be and how on Shabbat the city and the port would close down because of so many Jews. And now I think there's only like maybe a thousand or less. And then looking at the series and ending the series with my grandfather or ending or the image before when I had it up here of my grandparents traveling from a land that they lived in and worshiped in and then coming to a new land, not knowing um, what was before them. But yet at the same time, I think there was a kind of positiveness to become part of a new community and to become part of a community that in a sense would carry on a tradition. And so even though there was horror that they were leaving, living and leaving, that that horror did not get in the way of their positive feelings about being Jewish and being Sephardic and hoping that this new land would allow for a new kind of richness that would occur. Now, to answer the other question about my own work, um, I, th I think it, it has played a significant role in the sense that maybe other images of mine will relate much more to my heritage and to the spiritualness of what I grew up in. And, and who, know who knows, maybe I'll continue this series. You know, I, I sort of see the series, and I think Devin does too, as a possibility for a book, you know, in that sense. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, certainly I hope others have had this experience of being kind of transformed by it. I've had little chats with each of you, or some of you, about that question, about like, what, what was this, these two days for you? And I, I think, you know, seems like it's produced some really vital, valuable, and, and impressive kind of results. So well done, Devin, I guess, or something like that. Um, and you all. Uh, I've been told, you know, that we're most to, meant to wrap up at 9, and it's 9.01. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if anyone has a last word they want to add, um, it's, it's now or... Yes? Yes. It was a photo. Yeah. Uh, Why well, I, I couldn't tell you because I wasn't looking at it, but there were two photos of synagogues that I chose to, to have uh, included uh, on my poster. One was of the Addis Synagogue in Jerusalem, which is uh, the Addis Synagogue in Jerusalem, which is the center of the Aleppo tradition of Hazanut. And still to this day, every week, there, it's one of the only, uh, it, it's one of the really, I don't want to say one of the only, there are, there are a, num a number of communities that do this, but it's really the center of the practice of Sephardic Hazanut that assigns a maqam, one of these musical modes that underpins uh, Ottoman classical music, Turkish music, Arabic music, assigns a different one of these maqamat to every Shabbat to every parashan. So the, the Shabbat morning service would be conducted according to a different mode. So I, I chose that image because even though my family are, uh, are Syrian Jews that came to America, and it's a bit of a different experience, I chose that image because that to me represents one of the centers of our musical tradition in the world. And the other image that I chose was of uh, a synagogue in Aleppo that was unfortunately destroyed in recent years. And so I wanted to uh, include the memory of one of the many there are many, many synagogues in, in, in 
that area um, where my family came from that were destroyed. There was the, the Jobar synagogue outside of Damascus, which famously was said to be a place where Eliyahu Hanabi, the prophet Elijah, went into, fled into in, in his travels. And all of these places carry so much, so much memory and so much uh, you know, importance to, to the tradition. So I wanted to, as I was uh, playing music that evokes what would have been you know, sung by my ancestors you know, in prayer in those places. I wanted to give a little bit of the visual context for what, what those synagogues look like. Okay. Of course. Well, I know there's probably a pile of questions we'd all like to ask. I know I have others written down here, but I, I think instead I'm gonna say uh, memory uh, is probably the right note to end on. So thank you and please help me thank this amazing group. Thank you. Thank you so very much to the artists and to all of you for coming and spending the evening together. It's been really a remarkable experience. I hope that you have a lot to think about, a lot to reflect on, a lot that you have seen, a lot that you have heard, a lot that you have felt, and a lot that you have experienced. But has it been Sephardic arts? Take that question home with you. Thank you all, and the artists, please stay for a photograph.